Uh, okay, thank you very much for coming back for the second panel of the Data Bodies um, Symposium. Um, so this, I'm Maria, by the way, um, I've co curated this with Irini Papadimitriou. Uh, my name is Maria Kadzi Christodoulou, it's, a, it's pretty long, I appreciate that, or Maria X, as some people call me. Um, so the, the, the second part of this is about um, disruption um, or about critiquing, thinking around how can we critically engage interrogate, challenge, and possibly disrupt practices of data tracking and surveillance. And again, we've got five um, excellent speakers. Um, in actual fact, we've got six excellent speakers, because um, one of them has um, become two. And we'll start, with, uh, we'll start with Sarah Gold, who is an independent designer and is going to speak about citizenship 2.0. No, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. We're constantly asking ourselves this question of what the internet means to us, but what are we to the internet? Through the lens of feudal systems, we were called serfs. Monarchy called us subjects. The electoral system defined us as voters, and now industrial capitalism conceives of us as consumers. Because each new technology opens a new realm where we can be something that we've never been before. And in that new realm, we get to redefine ourselves. Yep. So today, our technologies are extraordinary. They allow us to know more about ourselves and the world around us than ever before. They kind of give us superpowers because they let us participate in our own evolution. You can fly in the eyes of a drone. You can ride a roller coaster in your bedroom or you can become an avatar and live in another world. But there's a problem. Because like it or not, many of these technologies are not just commodities. They are challenging and fundamentally changing our civic frameworks, our laws, our finance, our privacy, our culture. These are 21st century infrastructures. So who controls these technologies? Who writes the code and who owns the data? What do these technologies define us as? Well, they certainly don't see us as citizens. And in fact, they don't even see us as consumers. In most cases, we are just data clusters. Because every time we use a connected product or service, we produce a tsunami of personal data. It's just huge. It's something like posting, each of us posting, 27 million tweets every day. And that's before we get to this internet of things, internet of everything situation where everything <coughs> becomes connected. And companies aggressively mine and collect that data, often selling it to advertisers or others, um, because they make huge profits from that information. Their business models depend on our information. The problem is, is we have no control of our data. We don't control who gets to harvest it, what they can do with it, or even where it's stored. So we're all now in a position where we have gigabytes of data fragmented across the internet, stored in multiple kind of centralized silos out of our reach. And I think we might be going back to a time where we were kind of like this gleaners. And gleaners were individuals who worked for their livelihoods on land that they neither owned, nor were employed to cultivate, nor meaningfully controlled. But at least back then, these individuals knew who they were. And this situation of kind of data mining and losing control of our information is only going to get worse. Because the Internet of Things is 
upon us, the internet of everything, where all objects around us become data conscious and connected to the internet. And that means that your pots and your pans will be connected, your breadboard, your toaster, your car, and they will all be connected and collecting data about you. So it's going to become an awful lot more information, but also far more granular about our lives. The problem is, as you've been talking about this morning and we will continue to talk about this afternoon, is the ethics of this practice mean that we don't have privacy right now. And there are also huge security concerns for these technologies that we are increasingly delegating really important parts of our lives to. You know, driverless cars and even thermostats. These are machines that keep us alive. And we are delegating kind of technology and algorithms to look after us, but we don't understand them. And I think that's quite dangerous. This um, kind of strange graphic shows some research from MIT students, which showed that it takes kind of 12 points of your fingerprint to find you, but it only takes four points of big data to find you anywhere. And I think this is one kind of statistic that really sticks with me because it's the one statistic that I can really understand kind of what Snowden talks about, um, which is that it only takes a few points of unique information to then grow a web out from that one piece to connect to many other pieces of information and to really find out a quite granular information about our lives and our families' lives and our communities. And this is where it gets interesting because privacy isn't really just about you. It's about everyone. It's about your family, your community, the, the country, the world. And I think that's really hard to understand because we have increasingly um, experiences on, with technologies that are about us. We have this kind of idea of digital solipsism that we are alone when we are connected but the truth is we're not. And that's where I think it's really hard to understand privacy because it's not about you. Going back to this kind of analogy with citizenship and infrastructures, you know, in the 20th century, our infrastructures were transport networks, roads, electricity. These were made for the common good and designed to support innovation through open design standards. But in the 21st century, our infrastructures are Google, Twitter, Uber. They're monopolies and private companies working solely in the interests of a very narrow venture capital investment model. The products and services they are capable of supporting have absolutely nothing to do with us as citizens and everything to do with their business interests. And something quite that's happened just in the last week, I think it is, is that Twitter has changed their kind of favourites icon from stars to hearts. And I think this is a really great example of how if infrastructures are owned in the wrong way, they will eat themselves eventually. Um, we think of Twitter as a kind of public utility, and I think most of us would be very happy if Twitter just stayed as it was that it didn't have kind of voting mechanisms, and now I didn't have to like something through a heart to say lol, or wow, or congrats. And I think we can see that this platform is already starting to kind of self-destruct because it's just owned in the wrong way. And this really matters because what we build has politics. And digital products and services are exerting influence on how power ultimately is distributed among us. So with everything we are making and building and designing and coding, we are inventing new forms of citizenship, deciding what rights, powers and capabilities the majority of us have. I think we need to seriously reconsider and rethink the way that we see success or growth. We've kind of got to a point now where we are almost infatuated with kind of startups and disruption and innovation. And yet disruption hides huge misery. And behind these um, incredibly powerful kind of planetary scale organizations and the services and products that they support um, kind of hides a lot of the tension about 
you know, who owns these technologies, who gets to be, you know, how does, how does payment work? How does um, labor work in, for these kind of services? And we also have this kind of strange belief as well that we will kind of go to a place where the answer is we'll all kind of become hackers or makers because we will all code and that will kind of solve our problems. And I don't think it will because actually not very many people want to code. And I don't think that many people necessarily need to either. And I think we need to kind of prioritize design thinking in this area to uncover the interactions we could have that give individuals um, choice over the, tech, like the controls of the technology that they use, but also greater understanding of what's happening behind this black box. I don't think it's quite as simple as just saying we'll have black boxes or we'll code for ourselves. There has to be a kind of middle space where we can have both the functionality of really great technologies, but also the kind of if this then that controls where we get to customize this tech around our own lives. But also the fact that like, technology will not save us, I'm sorry. <laughs> there is no technical solution to the problems that we see. Um, actually, we need social change as well. So the, what I'm gonna talk about now is kind of three key areas I think that we could look at at ways to really build new status quos by designing outside the current status quo. So thinking of really radical design for um, ethical products and services with ethical business models that design outside of this kind of um, patriarchal, militaristic kind of society that um, I can see that many of my um, colleagues might continue to design for because it's really hard to design outside what you already see. Like for in very simple terms, what are alternative logons to just, you know, your email address and password? Well, there's a plethora of different ways we could deal with that interaction. And yet we just tend to copy the same thing over and over and over again. So the three areas. The first is I think we need to be building and prioritizing new civic tools. And um, what I mean by this is the kind of tools, the, the kind of dark matter that sits behind a technology, whether that be kind of terms and conditions or the kind of ownership layers, these kind of layers of the stack behind actually what it, the physical thing that you see. Something I'm working on at the moment that is kind of a civic tool of this sort is something called data licenses. I'm working on a project to really rethink terms and conditions to the point where actually we might get to set the rules of engagement for ourselves. They work in a very similar way to Creative Commons. So they let you decide how you share your data, whether, you know, if you want to share your data, sorry, um, whether you want to share it for commercial or non-commercial or mixed use purposes, um, whether you will allow kind of central or local government to have access to that information and also whether they, those organizations can share your data under similar terms. This kind of license model for data shifts us from being kind of passive data producers to being engaged citizens. And I think that this is just one of many tools that are possible to make and implement that means that we can actually begin to reinvent our citizenship in a really meaningful way, but also take back control of our information. And these digital tools are possible by kind of technical advances in um, the data architecture. So literally how the data is stored underneath these products and services, whether that's blockchain technology, which is one of many technologies that allow us to rethink the way that databases kind of talk to each other, how data can be shared. Distributed ledgers is another one. It's really interesting. You should have a look. Um, the Government Digital Service have recently posted some blogs about a project called Registers. If you're interested in data architectures, do take a look at that. I think we also need to reimagine what the commons could or should be. So the commons are spaces that, in the way I see them anyway, online, that are spaces where we don't just consume, but we get to participate and learn too. So we've got Wikipedia, which I'm sure we all use pretty much every day. 
But I think there are a plethora of other forms of commons we could have, public space online, that we haven't even started thinking about yet. But also public space that's digital too. So when you go to a public park, what does that mean in the kind of digital sense as well? At the moment when you go into many public parks, you're offered free Wi-Fi that's actually really insecure. Um, but how could we make kind of public spaces, physical and digital, that are built for kind of common good, for public interests, not for private interests? An interesting example of a new form of commons, well, it's not even new, really. Libraries have been around for, for a long while, and we, you know, an, as a knowledge com commons. But there's a project called the Libraries Freedom Project that is installing kind of tour relay nodes and exit nodes in libraries. Tor essentially is a, is a browser that allows you to anonymously uh, browse the web, unlike kind of uh, Chrome, for instance, where your identity is kind of given over. You're not anonymous in that situation. Tor allows you to browse anonymously, um, which is really useful for in a number of situations, um, but also just gives you a, a, a much kind of greater um, control over your identity online and how that information is shared. So that's a really great project, do have a look. It's in the States at the moment, I'd love to see that kind of come over here to the UK. So I, the, the last kind of point I think um, I want to make is that I think we need new institutions as well. So many of these kind of civic tools and kind of uh, technologies that are capable of giving us um, technologies that empower us as citizens, like, like blockchains, like ledgers, need new custodians. And I, because it's very easy with open source technology to build a thing, but once you've built the thing, often it's quite difficult to maintain the quality of what you've built. That's why we kind of had all sorts of scares with SSL, uh, because this amazing technology was actually being maintained by like two people that everyone, the whole world was using on the web. So I think we need new custodians. And these might not be kind of BBCs in the sense that they might not need bricks and mortar. These could be, I think, networked groups of individuals around the world who have responsibility of being custodians, of stewarding, um, for instance, the data licenses I showed you before and maintaining the commons where, for instance, um, pools of really great data would be shared under kind of non-commercial licenses or, you know, for, or maybe public licenses. And I think this is because no government or commercial company could ever be an impartial custodian. Um, we do need new networked organisations, and a few of them are, are up here. So there's WikiHouse Foundation on the far left. This is a non-profit foundation I helped to found kind of a couple of years ago. It, WikiHouse is an open source building system. I'm not going to go into that now because of time, but... Uh, WikiHouse is trying, what we're trying to do is be a custodian for the kind of, for a networked digital age. And it is hard, but we're learning lots, particularly about voting rights and how we set up governance within the foundation. There's also groups like Unmonastery, who are thinking really hard at how you can set up custodians that are established for long-term thinking, not for projects that um, are disruptive and have big exit strategies, projects that are there just to make our lives better or easier, these kind of social um, projects. Also Wikimedia Foundation, which is the foundation for Wikipedia, but also Ethereum. So Ethereum are the kind of black logo on the right. They have built a public blockchain. And whilst you could talk about the blockchain, I actually think the way that they um, allow developers to push code on Ethereum is really interesting. The way that they've set up rules in terms of who can commit core code and not. And this, remember, this is a kind of networked organization. They're not always working around the same table to have discussions or arguments. This is happening over the web. And I think we could learn a lot from these kind of software groups as to how we could kind of run um, future um, institutions. So to wrap this presentation up, um, I think we have the chance to build a stronger definition of citizenship than we inherited because we are the first generation to have the opportunity to write our version of what it means to be a citizen, not just in legal code, but in actual code. And as a designer, I think that's really exciting. Thank you very much for listening to me.
Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, wonderful. And so the second presentation uh, will take questions and have conversation at the end. So we'll go through all of the presentations. And the second presentation well, is um, by Mark Garrett and Ruth Cutlow, who are co-founders and co-directors of um, Further Field, that's been doing work in the field of art and technology for many years. And it's, it's very important. And the presentation is called Art, Data and Disruption. I'd just like to start by saying uh, we had a broken USB stick, so Jake here has helped us to uh, reconstruct our slideshow over lunch. Uh, so it, if, it, if it's... Thank you, Jake. So uh, if it's... Those that know us will know that it might not have been that slick in the first place, but it would have been really slick otherwise. But um, oh, yes. yeah, bear with us, please. <coughs> okay, who starts? You. Oh, okay. So, uh, my name's Mark, and we've been going as a kind of artist-led collective since 96-97, and uh, I come from a kind of uh, hacking background originally in street arts from Bristol, and and uh, we, where we used to work with uh, uh, BBS systems, which are called bulletin board systems, and also... Uh, well, lots of stuff like that, and also hacking televisions and hacking radio and running pirate radio stations. But the belief behind that, which comes from very much a kind of punk kind of etiquette or uh, cultural kind of claiming of your own context, is that you create your own conditions rather than having the conditions created for you by someone else. And uh, so, and so, in other words, when, what was, that's what's so great in Bristol with black culture in Bristol that we could share pirate radio with them with the same belief that you're actually creating your own context with other people where people can share uh, a creative voice uh, against uh, neoliberalism. And so, and in a way, that hasn't stopped. And so, in a way, that's the story of Furberfield. It's a bit like that, where we're doing it a much more less kind of uh, aggressive way where we're trying to have conversations with different people uh, that are, uh, and connecting uh, lots of bridges between different cultures like academia, hacking, uh, kinds of, and kind of, uh, what's that happy clappy thing? Hipster technology. <laughs> and, uh, and stuff like that. And uh, what else am I supposed to say? We had a whole script as it's gone. <laughs> Uh, well, you're, the picture you're looking at here is uh, Furtherfield Gallery, which is based in the heart of Finsbury Park, which is parking up in North London. We've also got a common space as well, where we have uh, workshops and events. So, so we're, we're kind of working across three different kinds of spaces. One's a space for, so we, we do art shows, labs and debate. These are kind of the three main areas that we're operating in. And our kind of core uh, we, we, we're an organisation for arts, technology and social change, so we're really looking and have been doing really as the web got going as a space that anyone could publish to. We're, we're looking to provide opportunities for people from very diverse, various backgrounds to get involved in creating their own context and thinking about how technology is uh, shaping their lives and how they might shape it back. Um, I don't know, Mark, if you'd like to talk well, about... Uh, this is just about our online community. Yes. <laughs> so we've got uh, various platforms that are self-built. Uh, this, the main platform uh, which we use for Furfield is Drupal, and uh, it's kind of you've got main key players that have built the structure, but then you've also got other people, which is the community, that have kind of commented and also shared code to build the larger community. Uh, so and so in a way, Furfield's a very slow neighborhood where it's not like a quick solution lots of people involved have helped build it with us online and also and so in a way if we've got other platforms that have been built for specifically for particular uh processes of creative exchange one of them is called uh visitor studio where people play uh, have a real-time audio visual kinds of experience together from all over the world. So we've got uh, further noise, we've had to close down because we run out of money, it'll come back another time. But it gives, and we've got loads of different 
uh, we've got Net Behaviour, which is the most traditional email list in a way, and uh, and also we're starting up a a new project called uh, Netarati, which is the alternative to Twitter. It runs on a GNU uh, GNU license, so it's a, a GNU version of Twitter. So what we what we've realised is that uh, uh, what's interesting about uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter is is immediacy and and also what's and the, the the flexibility between different platforms and so what we and but the other the most important thing is ownership of data that's the biggest issue where people in that community aren't being exploited of, of their data without their choice or without discussion netarati is set up to actually start that and we're starting that when are we starting that soon soon and uh, it's all it's up there ready we just haven't <laughs> told anyone <laughs> okay so i've just remembered a slide that we have missing have we? which i'm going to ask mark to talk about even though there's no slide for it <laughs> so we were, we were going to give this little introduction and then we were going to really talk about artists doing hacks to help us think about data and make data make our use of data and experience of data more feelable and to make these abstractions more feelable and that's a lot of what further field has been about so often the kind of politics of of data and technical infrastructures they're happening they're, they're in the control of the of a, of a kind of elite whether they be the the code that the holders of wealth and power and the reason we feel it's important to situate ourselves in a public park or online is really to make these things more available to more people so mark i'm sorry i forgot to get the slide up for it, but so could I'll you talk about commodify.us yeah. so uh, there's a really interesting someone was discussing uh, earlier in the earlier panel about uh, uh, facebook and stuff like that and what's interesting about a group called who are hackers from i think they're from uh, Holland or Netherlands and or Berlin I'm trying to remember now actually they're from both places and it did commodify dot us and the interesting thing about it is that it uh, shows you how t how you can personally relate to your own personal data online and so what it was is that you go to Facebook or you'll go to Google or you go to another web 2.0 platform and in if you go to the settings and uh, you can and uh, and preferences you could actually uh, own your data again and reclaim it and download your data onto your onto your uh, desktop or onto your external hard drive or wherever you put your data want to and what it does you can and it takes hours so if you've been on Facebook say I don't know for seven years or something uh, it'll take probably about 40 minutes to download the data because it's images and it's all compressed images and videos or whatever you've been doing on Facebook but the important thing about that is that you it, it forces you to go through the process to experience a relationship with the data itself as a material source so in other words rather than an abstract out of touch concept and so and once you do that what happens is that uh, uh, the commodify dot us uh, uh, asks you to upload the data and and once you upload the data it gives you uh, a few choices in how you want to interact with your own data and and what that does and unfortunately uh, uh, the head fund just didn't want to take it any further uh, or who was because uh, I only got a short amount of funding and they've gone to larger other projects but what I liked about commodify.us it made you understand uh, the power of owning your own data at that moment in time and it's a, and it's a first principle it's like in a game you're at the first point first level of the game where you just experience ownership of data you don't actually experience the metadata itself so in other words you're not actually empowered realistically but you've just got to start at the first stage of experiencing what data is and where you can what you can do with it potentially, and so commodified to us is that, and it's quite interesting. So, so, uh, go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we thought it would be useful for us just to talk about a couple of projects, a, a couple of exhibitions. So these are two exhibitions from our summer program in the gallery. Um, at the beginning of the summer, we had an exhibition that was called Beyond the Interface. And it was inviting people to come in and get 
kind of to better understand their position in the kind of cybernetic loop and this is kind of connecting with what Sarah was talking about sorry <laughs> <laughs> just ignore me <laughs> Uh, what Sarah was just talking about. So it's understanding that. <laughs> oh God. It's, it's, so it's about understanding that um, as we carry our devices around with us that are spewing out this kind of location data uh, the, through the understanding how we're moving, how we're using different uh, platforms and, and then through our interactions on Facebook and Twitter that we're kind of giving out this kind of clouds and clouds of data that are then used in order to better... To, in order to better understand us as individuals but also kind of as masses as populations and then that information is then re, re kind of uh, fed back into the loop which then informs future design and so that we're, we're constantly in this loop and it felt important to us to have an exhibition to just kind of bring to people's attention that we maybe want to take some agency in that in that loop and to kind of think about the things that we're signing up for um, I'll just quickly describe two works so this is a work called the facial weaponization suite fag face uh, by Zach Blass um, Zach um, was is freaked out by the kind of coming together, the convergence of facial recognize, rec oh, I can't say the word, facial recognition software and uh, CCTV technology, and finally the so the the kind of profiling, personal profiling software. So all of these things come together, and was providing it was providing the powers that be, whether they be corporate or state. Uh, with the ability to identify uh, gay and trans people as they walked down the street. And he sees this as a potentially oppressive convergence of technology. So what he'd been doing was running a series of workshops where he invited people to come and have their faces 3D scanned. And then they were offering their faces up to a kind of composite face in order to produce a mask that we can see him wearing here and he would walk they they would then use these masks as protest masks so using using the idea of a mask as protest like we've seen with anonymous something which is simultaneously an expression of solidarity it preserves the anonymity of the protester and it raises it raises the issue um, he's produced a very uh, precisely argued video which documents the the, the kind of areas of concern and, and the process that he went through and I strongly recommend you go and have a look at it. Um, this is a shot of a work that we've shown in a couple of places now called A Charge for Privacy by Branger Briz. Uh, they're an American uh, duo. Um, written around the Perspex box are the terms and conditions for use of this artwork. It's a mobile, it's an iPhone charging station. If you plug your iPhone into it, you, you, you're, you, can, you can charge your phone here. And if you accept the terms and conditions, it sucks all the images off your phone and puts them up on the gallery wall. Um, this, we've seen this be particularly powerful among younger people. So uh, we are all probably fairly used to at least expecting terms and conditions to be trying to take away our rights and, and to exploit us. But we've seen these kind of waves of hysteria move through bodies of young people as one of them has plugged it in, accepted the terms and conditions without reading it and then realised what's going on. So it's this thing of you have this in a public space and then people see each other interacting with them and it's very powerful. Um, this is our last... Well, it's not... Not quite last, but uh, uh, basically uh, we've always been interested in what happens behind the interface of culture. And uh, because I'm also, we're very interested in uh, deconstructing the power relationships between technology and different uh, hegemonies that exist in society. And I think that, I think what people have been saying earlier on is quite poignant and I think uh, I wrote something down quickly, which relates to uh, Maria's uh, 
Where's Maria? Maria's talk about data, about data uh, to do with uh, medical and the, the, all that data that's being collected. And, and I thought, well, that to me sounds like indigenous data, where it's about we're just all of us who are an indigenous set, uh, data, where just like indigenous people that have been kind of, uh, our data's been accumulated as though we're just indigenous. And, uh, and then we're alienated from our own resources. Yeah, so then we're alienated yeah. from our own culture, just like uh, Africa is, regarding its own resources, so we can make nice technology. And so, uh, so basically, we started this new project called Art Data Money. And it's, to, like it says on the thing, uh, to build commons for the arts and network age. But really, it's a, it's a kind of a very flexible activist project where you, uh, in a kind of, uh, in a polite sense, where it's uh, disrupting the relationship between art, data and money, where we can explore different cultures that are building on uh, disrupting that relationship with business as well as with power relations around data. And, and it's really, again, uh, Sarah has, uh, Sarah has oh, yeah. her, um, the data, the alternate, that she showed the license for the kind of thinking, how we can think about how to control our data. She's in the show that we've just opened, which is called The Human Face of Crypto Economies, which is currently on show at the gallery. Come and see it. One more weekend to go after this weekend. Um, and it's really looking at how uh, big data and the blockchain might be opening up new opportunities for us to actually form a commons. And it, it, again, what we're saying is, is really building on what Sarah just spoke about. It's about helping us to both understand the kind of... Uh, so in the exhibition, we're using uh, the kind of symbolic impact of art as a way to stimulate discussion, but we're also looking for very practical uses at how we might get a hold of these technologies and make them work for us. Um, I'd like to show... Uh, how long is this? Two it's minutes? a two-minute video. And, OK, so the reason... This, it, with, this is a piece by Jennifer Lynn Marone called Jennifer Lynn Marone, Inc. Um, I think we might finish with this. Oh, it's, so we're not going to talk about... That okay, one. we it can depends. we go to that one? Can we go to that one and leave that one? Okay, go and look at Jennifer Le Jennifer Limarone Inc. It's a two minute video it, that's very precise in describing our relationship with corporations and our and, and how differently those relationships help us to mediate our own data and control over our own data. But Mark would like to finish well, with we've, this. We've been in Lincoln uh, uh, and uh, the Frequency Festival. People asked us to. Uh, uh, it's year of Magna Carta, so it helps celebrate the year of Magna Carta, and so we uh, went up to Lincoln and and celebrated uh, a people's version of the Magna Carta. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that went on which I can't, haven't got time to actually, which is, was really exciting. Lots of people really interested. Loads of people. You can check out the hashtag yeah. if you want to get a sense of what. I happened. just want to say before we move on is that. Uh, the interesting thing about digital art or media art culture not being seen in the kind of freeze world is weird because when we sh we've been surviving for near 20 years as Furfield and our exhibitions are packed and they're not just packed with people that think they're kind of going to see a media art show. So it's a really weird position at the moment. You've got this kind of parallel world between the kind of like... I see it's a kind of really shallow art culture uh, when you've got and you've got this all this amazing work of these younger other people that are not just all different generations really thinking about this stuff through technology and it's not just inside technology it's outside as well as some of the presentations showed earlier and so and when we uh, when we showed this which is the the bust of uh, uh, Edward, Edward Snowden, Snowden. Uh, in, uh, which is uh, in Lincoln, th it caused quite an excitement because they because a lot of people uh, are very excited, obviously, about Edward Snowden. But now they can have their own 3D print of it, and uh, and and well, that's what uh, the fun of technology is, where you can disrupt the kind of media 
trickle down you know that comes down that, that's not that you know it doesn't really relate to you so look what's so nice about 3d printing all these new technologies they kind of allow you to kind of interact in a slightly subversive way but then you can build on that but one other thing i want to say we also took part in the the bill of digital rights uh, which was a discussion in uh lincoln which is which is uh, which with cyber salon and 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 that's going to be happening again next year and there's and there's going to be a book written about the bill of digital rights by dr richard barbrook and uh, we'll be involved in some of that and that's really important because people were mentioning that earlier on and there are people that are researching the bill of digital rights right now and discussing it and it's really important to uh touch that because that's going to be the most important probably i think it's contemporary version of the magna carta so go. I, I think we should stop that's it we've finished thank you <laughs>
Um, so yes, I mean, there is a bunch of people, coders, um, who can encrypt the private data, who can encrypt the data to be a private, but it is all, only a very small um, number of people. Um, and uh, there is a gigantic amount, as Sarah and, and Ruth and Mark said, there is a gigantic amount of data right now out there. And, you know, there is, there is lots of data available to people, however, the problem is that we don't have um, accessible tools for everyday person to access this data. People don't know even what to do with this data. And I think that's what we, what we should be focusing on is, well, first of all, to make sure that the data is open and it's not used for profit. But second of all, how to make it understandable, accessible, and also how to show people how to apply it um, for their own kind of benefit and, and for the benefit of the environment and, and, well, everyone else, I suppose. Um, but um, yes, I mean, I don't deal with privacy. I deal with environmental data and my kind of take on it is that I'm trying to actually use open data or sometimes hack data in order to show to people what is out there and, and make it understandable. So I work with um, things like electrical signals from plants or um, uh, marine data or, or uh, data from um, um, bacteria, etc., etc. Um, and so I'm just going to show you a few projects where I was using data which I hope in a way um, make viewers to start thinking about their own data and their own behavior. And um, yeah. <laughs> So one, one project which I did a few years ago was called Oil Compass. Um, and Oil Compass was made for uh, Protei, which was initiative um, uh, set up in 2010 after the uh, um, oil spill in uh, Mex Go uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico. And it was initiated by Cesar Harada. And a bunch of people came together to, first of all, design an unmanned um, a sailing drone, which uh, would be open source and open hardware, so that people who are affected by oil spills could make something like that for their own use, so that they could actually clean the, the, the spills from their kind of shores. And I, what I was doing for that was something called Oil Compass, which um, was supposed to show to anyone the traffic of oil vessels and the positions of oil rigs, as well as the uh, um, biggest oil spills in the history. Um, and so my task actually, you know, that, that was the kind of whole idea that um, we will be able to show those information to people. And, you know, first of all, in that case, the people who are affected will be able to um, act upon the information, make the drone and send it wherever it's needed, but also kind of try to raise the, the, the environmental awareness of oil spills. Um, by law, each single marine vessel uh, is supposed to send an automatic um, identification signal. Um, and it is supposed to be available um, to everyone. Uh, basically, the marine law states that um, it is very important to make sure that um, there is no ship collisions, etc., on the sea. And that is true with like uh, regular ships uh, and, and regular vessels. However, um, so here actually you have a screenshot of uh, area of Rotterdam um, with real-time traffic of oil vessels. However, the biggest problem which we have had was with the oil rigs, because even though oil rigs actually are supposed to be uh, under the same law, the, the big well, private or, you know, big corporations that are trying to make it as difficult as possible to actually get these details. Um, we found a way around it because we had some data about the positions of oil rigs, but also which single oil, oil rig has the uh, helicopter pad sign, which has to be available publicly, publicly. So we started juxtapositioning those two sets and then we ended up with, um, I don't know if all of the oil rigs, but at least some. Um, we also mapped the biggest uh, oil spills in the history. Um, and the funny thing is when I actually made this data and I, I positioned it on, onto the um, image of, of the earth during the night, um, 
well, I don't know if you can see clearly, but the biggest spills happened in areas which are actually very well lit up. Um, while I don't, I don't have this screenshot actually, but um, when you look at the data of oil rigs and oil vessels, they are very much scattered in places like Angola, for example, which are not very well lit up. And out of it, we just made an art installation where people actually ca could navigate through the uh, you know, Earth and globe and, and look at all this set of data. Um, Another installation which I um, did is called Entropy, and um, I, I said in my title um, that it is, in a way, about self-surveillance. Um, however, um, as I stated, I don't really deal with the private data, and what I mean by the self-surveillance is to look at the data which is available out there and see how it affects us and how we affect that um, uh, uh, well, not data, but, but environment from um, which data we gathered. So Entropy is the installation which um, deals also with the issue of, of um, trying to make a data tangible and, and kind of more um, tactile um, to people, as data is a very, very abstract um, concept which lives somewhere here, but we don't really, we don't really, ca we can't really touch it, we can't really, well, we really don't know what it looks like, in a way. Um, and um, for entropy, um, we were looking at, uh, by me actually, I mean me and, and my colleague Eric Overmeer, who is my normal kind of regular collaborator. We were looking at um, the data of uh, global uh, electricity consumption, which was visualized in real time. Um, and which is actually provided by a website called worldometers.info. I don't know if you have heard about it. Um, and this type of data, it is publicly available. I mean, you can go on the website and, and look at it. However, you can't really use it um, for your own purpose unless you pay, which we kind of found it's quite wrong. Um, so we hacked it. Um, and so the visualizations on, on this type of um, above the light bulb are based on, on that hack data. And then we uh, also had Arduino with temperature sensors which were um, creating um, the visualization on the floor. Basically, it was kind of a projection mapping. So the data was kind of you know visualized over your body and you could spill it around and you can kind of do lots of other things with it. Um, and we kind of wanted to see whether people can understand the, the kind of concept of, you know, the global um, uh, energy consumption vis -a how little energy we produce as a person. So we consume, but we don't really give much back. Another project which I am involved in right now is called Planet. Um, I'm co-founder of Worldwide Lab. Um, and it is the art collective which deals with um, biological, environmental uh, issues. Um, and Planet is a device which um, actually Adrian Godwin, who is here in the audience, who is our main electronic engineer, <laughs> who's been very patiently working with us. Um, it is a device uh, which takes um, electrical signals from plants um, as the uh, uh, reactions to various environmental stimuli. Uh, basically, plants are the best environmental sensors you can possibly imagine because they can um, process amazing amount of information at very short period of time. Um, and they are much better than any kind of human-made device. So saying that, we made another device which kind of tries to get that, that signal so that we can translate it and understand it and understand something more about, env our, uh, about our environment. And it is released as the open source and open hardware uh, because what we are trying to do is to kind of make sure that that device um, can be used by absolutely anyone all over the world so that people actually can be independent from um, various information and data sets provi provided by government or, or any kind of corporations, but actually try to find something out about, uh, about environment um, by themselves. And um, sadly, we are not using any type of um, alternative 
yet uh, methods of um, data acquisition and data gathering from, from the community which we are building. Um, at the moment, actually, we even uh, can't say whether we can go around uh, using something which is uh, not very mainstream, because we want to make sure that it is as accessible as possible. Um, and the last work which I would like to show you is called The Anatomy of the Human Breast, um, which also was made with Adrian Godwin. Um, and it is about um, looking at your own exhaled breath and the chemicals of your own exhaled breath and, uh, um, and the composition of the uh, chemicals in your own uh, exhaled breath. Uh, juxtaposi uh, juxtapositioned with the uh, visualization of the air quality data. Um, so I think, you know, I think it's the only project where actually I, I, I deal with the uh, bodily data and some sort of privacy, maybe. Um, but basically, um, every person who is, I don't know why is it going so fast right now, um, every person who is somehow affected um, with um, any type of COPD or asthma, they exhale a nitric oxide. And uh, the nitric oxide, and obviously um, the asthma and COPD is on the rise in places like London and, you know, big kind of cities in, in um, big, big urban environment because of the pollutions. Um, and so, um, what I kind of try to do is to see whether people can look at their kind of exhaled breath and look at themselves as the human sensors of the environment around. Um, so this visualization actually is the visualization of um, exhaled human breath. And this one is the visualization of the air quality in Sheffield. And here again, you know, kind of talking about the open data and the tools, uh, that, that's another kind of the open data is there, but tools are very kind of, um, they're not accessible. So I don't know, have you heard about Sparkle? Anyone? Sparkle API? Well, that's, that's, that's the problem. Here you go. Um, how can we deal with open data if we don't have very widely accessible tools? Uh, if we suddenly have to find out about Sparkle API, which I learned about last year, and I had to use it in order to make this visualization, and to understand actually what the whole data means. Um, so yeah, that, that's it, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. Cassia. This is also a work that we had here last yes, year. So it's, um, it's really lovely to be able to show that. Um, okay, and um, <laughs> the next speaker is um, uh, Daphne Dragona, um, who is it. here all the way from Berlin. So thanks, Daphne, for coming. <laughs> Um, and um, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy this is here because I've worked with Daphne a very long time ago back in Athens when we were both doing together a festival called Media Terra. Uh, but then Daphne went on to do things uh, great and big and last year she curated um, Transmediale uh, on the subject of capture all, so very relevant to that. Um, and she's a curator, writer and gets the candidate at the University of Athens and she will talk about tracking life. Okay, hello, good afternoon, and thanks very much, uh, Maria and Irini, for inviting me. It's very nice being here. Um, yeah, so what I will talk about, uh, in a way, reflects my curatorial and uh, research work of uh, the last few years. I'd like to take the chance to go a bit back in time and uh, mention uh, Roger Clark, who was uh, the person that kind of coined the term data variance uh, that we are using nowadays, which is like the systematic monitoring of people's actions or communications through the application of information technology. And this was already kind of framed in uh, 1984, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, ten years later, uh, Roger Clark uh, referred to the digital persona, which is like a, a model of the individual established through the collection, storage, and analysis of, data, analysis of data about that person. 
uh, it's very interesting to look back in time and see how Clark was kind of uh, pointing exactly to things that we are discussing, uh, discussing today as well. And he was particularly saying that the digital persona is a potentially threatening, deeming, and perhaps socially dangerous phenomenon. Uh, because data surveillance provides an economic, economically efficient means of exercising control over the behavior of individuals and societies. And he was particularly talking, of course, about corporations and government and, and governments and what uh, role would this digital persona would play. Um, another uh, kind of use of the wo of uh, particularly now the term data body is from critical under, uh, art ensemble uh, the same around the same period where they called the data body the faces sibling of the virtual body a much more highly developed virtual form and one that exists in complete service to the corporate and police state and um, again, it's interesting to, to recall that Manuel Castells at the same time was referring to a new um, barbarianism, as he called it, which was kind of made out of a fundamental opposition between the net and the self. So it's interesting to see that at this period we were talking about an asymmetry of power already, a kind of an asymmetrical uh, threat. And a, particularly tension, a particular tension was kind of highlighted. Uh, now, going uh, like a decade before, um, we find the term database self by uh, scholar Simon, where he more um, kind of uh, takes also Mark Poster into consideration and talks about databases and how we're kind of uh, being um, kind of uh, uh, how our data is being stored the whole time, but how we're also in a way willingly giving data in. And um, and I think that what is important to kind of uh, point out here is that a decade before is when what I would say the user-generated data bodies started being formulated with uh, the social media in particular. So how we are kind of started giving in our data more and more. And uh, coming now to where we are now, um, I like a lot this framing by Jennifer Whitson, who is a scholar uh, from Canada working on uh, games and surveillance, also studying the quantified self movement. And uh, she uses uh, this term data double, uh, which is very nice because uh, she, with this, uh, with, with this kind of uh, term, she also, of course, mentions how we have a kind of uh, self that works on our behalf, but we cannot control it at all. We don't know what is happening. And uh, what she, uh, mentioned is that we what is what really has changed is that we now care for our virtual selves curating and maintaining the accuracy of our data doubles the informational profiles that have become the lifeblood of our interactions with others and the real objects of governance and this is like the point that I would really like to start this kind of a uh, change of how we, we started caring about the data that we are collecting because we want to collect them um, so where we are, or where many people are, is like um, kind of always putting an effort of uh, showing the best of ourselves. And kind of, uh, well, this is an image of, from cloud, for instance, a network that I guess a lot of you know that kind of aggregates data from different networks and kind of comes up with a total score for your performance in social media and then kind of rewards you also for well, how well you're doing. So, and of course, we are also being invited to track our sleep, to track our steps. And um, I mean, Fitbits and, and wristbands nowadays are also kind of, as uh, Phoebe also mentioned, are used by um, companies to track how well their uh, employees are doing. So in a way, the wellness of the company now depends on how fit you are, which is another very interesting concept. Uh, talking about the fastest sibling that the critical art ensemble could already see coming quite some years ago. Um, and there was, uh, this, this is um, kind of a, a phrase from Kate Crawford when she was discussing in a very nice article last year about how um, the new tracking devices and the wristbands will be used uh, in the future more and more. And she was referring to this legal case where the data of uh, Fitbit were used uh, in court. 
so she's raising this question of what will happen. Will people's relationship to their wearable device change when they know that it can become an informant? While uh, Brooke Venn, who is um, a scholar that wrote The Allure of the Selfie, a very interesting book, uh, she says that we surrender our temporal identities in order to become stylized, quantified, and distributed. So th the question is, what traps us in this image of the data that we ourselves constru construct about ourselves? Uh, now, uh, I myself working, I have worked in the past uh, quite a lot on, on games and the field of game art, and somehow continuing this and trying to use the knowledge that I had, I went into studying what gamification is nowadays and how game elements are used more and more in fields that do not anymore concern games. Um, so, for instance, uh, of course, we could, see, we could see here that the idea of using game elements in non-game envi non -game environments is not so new in a way. It was kind of always used in education, for instance. And um, if we want to more to talk about the, la the people that kind of log their activities, this is also not so new. But what really changed the last few years is that we have this kind of, all of us being connected, this in a way created a perfect territory for this kind of gamification uh, layer to come and to uh, allow the possibility to somehow take control of our data and giving access for this data to others. Of course, the games were kind of the, the perfect tool, the perfect in-between uh, kind of facilitator to come and do this because they, they kind of offer the stage. We are like, we are invited to, to perform ourselves. We are invited to, to perform. We are invited to, to show how good we are. And, um, and there is a kind of a very interesting um, kind of, uh, let's say, story, history of how games like the last um, two centuries have been used in a way that it's not so much discussed. And here I'm not talking about the critique of gamification, but rather about how play has been rationalized and instrumentalized uh, until we reach the stage that we're in. Because the things that we're talking about today, when we're talking about how we optimize ourselves or how everything becomes uh, calculable, and these are things that came up already in, in the 19th century, and then play was kept aside because it was continued kind of dangerous uh, opposed to work. But nowadays, they found a way to bring these two together. Um, and these are also kind of elements that um, we started discussing like uh, around one decade ago when we were talking about the role of games more and more. This is an image from Sims. And uh, it's, it's interesting to, to kind of remember that in uh, an environment like the Sims environment or in the world of Warcraft, the players were already kind of trying to uh, optimize themselves and their behavior was normalized in a way, things that we discuss again today. So in, um, in a nice article, for instance, uh, written by Flanagan two or three years ago, she particularly examines this and she, remem she reminds us how being, um, having a character in the Sims environment meant that, of course, you have to take care of your character but what does this mean? This means that the character has to have a good job, has to make good money, um, has to have a good life, to be properly accepted. And somehow, although it's a, a kind of a game, let's say, that has a lot of freedom, that there are no specific rules, at the same time, this uh, character is more and more, his behavior or her behavior is more and more normalized. Now, when we come to where we are today, because we are dealing more with uh, data that have to do with uh, social networks or uh, with uh, tracking devices, then this is, of course, data about our real selves. And this is how things really change. And uh, what I would like just to very briefly say that what happens nowadays is that we are more and more allowing ourselves to be identified, commodified, and normalized through uh, these tracking devices. This is, of course, easy to understand by how you are kind of always uh, by the likes or the search that you do. Of course, you allow your preferences, for instance, to become clear. And at the same time, you allow advertisements to come in. And of course, at the same time, when you are always showing um, 
who your friends are, who you're following, or what you're interested in, you're always adapting your behavior to what your kind of audience is. Uh, and why, so why does play come in? Well, I would argue that it comes in because it's, uh, it serves what we could call soft power, a term that uh, has been used already in 1990 by Joseph Nye. And it's an interesting concept that, uh, of course, you might know of how power is no longer imposed, but it comes in in a rather gentle way in order to get the others to do what you want. But for this to work, power has to be attractive. It has to have attractive elements. And this is what games, in a way, can do. And, and uh, this is uh, also um, a quote by Terranova, who used the term soft, soft control back in 2004. I'll go a bit, a bit more quickly. Uh, so having kind of this uh, framework in mind, my question would be, so what can we do about it? What is left to subvert? What kind of resistance we're talking about? Um, now, uh, Mark and Ruth already mentioned quite some examples that uh, are very much in the field that I'm also working on. What I tried to do the last few years was in a way to, is in a way, a classification, let's say, a categorization of how artists are responding to the datafication, which relates also to how gamification comes in uh, nowadays. Uh, I will just refer briefly to three or four of uh, these categories that I'm working on. So the first one um, is obfuscation, which uh, is a term that Helen Isenbaum and uh, Finn Banton have worked a lot on. A book of them is also recently published. Um, and this is the production, inclusion, addition, or communication of misleading, ambiguous, or false data in an effort to evade, distract, or confuse data gatherers, or diminish the rel reliability and value of data aggregations. So the interesting thing about obfuscation is that it's not camouflage, it's not hiding, it's about creating noise. It's about creating confusion. Uh, two, um, two works that pretty much reflect this, and we also uh, hosted both initiatives last year in Transmediale, um, our, the, the first one is Adnosium, which is a um, browser extension uh, developed by Daniel Howe and Mousson Zeraviv. And uh, as they call it, it's an omnivorous browser extension that clicks automatically on all advertisements appearing while allowing the user to keep her anonymity at the same time. So uh, users' profiles become uh, futile when advertisements company, uh, advertisement companies get more data than they can handle. Um, Mushan calls this a uh, playful approach in a way. So what would they do with your profile if it doesn't make sense in a way anymore? And a similar approach in a very different way is uh, taken by Heather Dewey Hackborg and uh, the work Invisible. Uh, where uh, basically Helen, uh, Heather um, developed a tactical kit for uh, your privacy against uh, uh, threats to bio biological privacy. So these two sprays that she has in this little uh, kit box is like the, the one uh, kind of deletes 99.5% uh, <coughs> of your DNA and it's called the array spray and the other spray um, cloaks the remain 5% with noise. So uh, this is, uh, in a way, how it works. Then uh, the second uh, uh, artistic practice that I would like to mention would be the one of over-identification, um, a practice that is quite well known in the field of uh, art, theory of art and history of art. Um, here with a kind of very nice quote of Bravo that it's what that they describe it, that describe it as this purposefully giving up your will to resist by applying the latter's rule even more consistently and scrupulously than the rest of society. So the idea is that what do you do? You, they say that somehow you shouldn't go into offering alternatives. That ne not, that's not necessarily the role of art. Um, but you should rather kind of identify with the, the power that is, with, that is being exercised over you. Um, like uh, kind of uh, classic examples from 
uh, that we could refer to from uh, earlier periods of time would be like the work of NSK or Leibach, and also maybe the Yes Men. In the, the, in the field of um, social media and media art, this is a very nice example that uh, Tobias Langruber uh, developed a uh, work that he developed like in 2002 where he, when he kind of set up an office in Berlin, he kind of dressed up as a Facebook officer and he started uh, producing these cards for the people that were coming in, the Facebook cards. So he was playing in a way a person from Facebook. Um, a more recent example by Eric Ascurti, um, Badiskan. Erika is using a very interesting approach of um, over-identification by showing us, in a way, how uh, the network sees us. So she always exposes, not always, but in many of her works, like this work and uh, the work that uh, she did some years ago, um, based on Google AdWords, have to do with how uh, exposing how the network sees us. So for this work, she was uh, reading the, um, she was using um, the CompFind uh, app from her iPhone. She was scanning her body, and then uh, she was kind of reading the um, results that would come up and the correlations that would come up as well. Um, and then a third uh, practice that uh, I would like to tackle um, is what I frame as data accelerationism, which of course is a reference to uh, accelerationism here referring more to philosophy and how it was especially recently, the last few years, discussed. Um, so the idea somehow here is that, um, as Saviro says, we're all accelerationists and realizing that you cannot really deal with the crisis. How about taking the things, taking things to the extreme? And the kind of the worse, the better, in a way. And this also reflects this idea that a lot of philosophers are working in, of the, the, that there is no outside anymore. There's nothing you can do. So how about if you push the system, take it to its uh, limits? And uh, two examples from uh, last year, the one would be uh, from Constant Dillard, high retention, slow delivery. That's a very interesting uh, exploit of uh, Constant Dillard, where in, uh, last year he bought 2.5 million followers, and he distributed them among successful art-related Instagram accounts. So uh, by doing this, he of course kind of changed the balance that would uh, within Instagram itself. And uh, he, of course, played with the system. He called it an army of profiles crafted to love and like. And, of course, also tackling the is issues of um, uh, um, like farming that came up recently. And another very in interesting example by Amal Amalia Ullmann, Excellences and Perfections. Um, here, Amalia Ullmann, in a way, became the accelerator herself like uh, a person knowing how, knowing very well how to play with what the networks offer us. So in, while being within this condition that we're kind of being invited to optimize ourselves and to show the ideal selves that the others want to see, she kind of uh, semi-staged herself online and he used in, she used Instagram and Facebook by posting words, images and moments about her life and about an effort to kind of always um, be always be the ideal person that she could, in a way, appear like. She even staged um, uh, uh, the uh, a, lift, a, a plastic surgery of, of her breast that was not real, mm -hmm. and uh, she faked it. And at the end, when she wanted to end that, she just kind of uh, mentioned it uh, on Facebook, and that was it. Some of the uh, people that were following her were, were kind of very disappointed. Um, there are beautiful uh, interviews and uh, documentation of her that you can find online if you want. Uh, I think I should stop, so I won't go into this now. I just wrap up uh, by saying one thing that I'm very often uh, asked if this is resistance and if we can frame it like that and what it can offer. 
And uh, what I can say about artists working on this, uh, towards this direction is that it's not only that they offer like ways of, I don't know, raising awareness. It's about that this is where we start from. And um, I, I think there is a very useful uh, approach coming already from Michel Foucault that he was saying that you should use uh, resistance in order to understand power. So this is for me what, what we need to kind of uh, do. This is why we can still turn to art in a way rather than questioning if this is in a way subversion or resistance or not. So it's like claiming our rights to understanding, let's say, what we have to deal with nowadays. I stop, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And so our last um, speaker um, for the day, last but not least, is um, uh, Professor James Connolly. And James uh, also travelled to get her today. He came from Hull, uh, which is closer than Berlin, but still, no. <laughs> Not necessarily so on the train. Um, uh, James Connell is Professor of Politics at the University of Hull, and he's also Director of the Institute for Applied Ethics. Um, and his talk is about the common good, and he will speak about issues of ethics and rights in cyber security. Sort of. I, if you can so all sure. hear me, I would prefer not to use a microphone, but can you hear me? It's, I've got the cameras as well. I was about that, that's okay. <laughs> okay, that, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, um, well now is the boring bit. This is essentially a written paper and you're going to have to suffer. I apologise for that, but not very much. Um, a few years ago I became interested in the relationship between the public and the private, arguing that the distinction was not one that was antecedent to politics, but one which is determined by politics. In other words, our legal and moral activities create the boundaries rather than pre-existing boundaries constraining them. So it follows that there's also no single distinction between public and private, but rather an overlapping set of categories of public and private. The geography of the public and private have been transformed, and one of the elements in this transformation is digital technology. Now this interest through serendipity and SOD's law, uh, segued into a leading in in an ESRC project on the common good, ethics and rights in cyber security. And the project poses what seems to be a simple question. Is it possible to come up with a fair and just system to deal with the differing demands made in cyberspace, especially in relation to the demands of cyber security? Now I'm going to say a little bit about the project and then I'm going to say something about the public-private distinction. And what I'm going to say about the public-private distinction is in a sense a subset of what I'll be doing in the project itself, but also relates very much to the comments made by Sarah and by Perry, and you'll see the connections. Okay, the project, Ethics and Rights in Cybersecurity, an unlikely sort of um, title in a sense, but... The fundamental issue of political authority is how to characterise the relationship between the freedom of the individual and the authority of the state. And one solution to this has always been the notion of the common good. But what is this in the context of cyber space, cyber governments, governance, cyber security and so on? Now, the project that we're dealing with, it's a two-year project, it concerns roles, rights, responsibilities of states, of corporations, civil society, NGOs, individuals. So it's concerned with agency, it's concerned with culture, the ability to act, deliberate, debate. And of course representations in science fiction and other forms and public perceptions of these issues. So it's a multidisciplinary approach and I'm just going to quickly tell you something about the project here before getting on to the interesting stuff. Um, we're trying to determine whether the notion of a common good is something that we can make sense of. Part of what I do when I, because I'm doing the political theory side, I distinguish it from the commons, for example, and a whole load of other notions that might seem to be the same as the common good. The public good is not the same as the common good, and so on. Now, I can amplify those comments later. It also identifies ways in which the assets of cybersecurity can be used to deliver and maintain the common good. It engages with discourses and notions of responsibility and rights in cyberspace. Overall, it brings together users, policy makers and academics. I say that point, I've missed a few bits out, because that's an invitation to you. We have another workshop coming up in May, 
We have another conference coming up next October, and there's a workshop in London as well, which isn't just our project in February. So if any of you turn out to be interested in this, please email me. You'll easily find my address either through this organisation or on the Hull University website. OK, what about the common good then? Many are sceptical of the notion, although the Green Party and the Guardian at the last election weren't. They use it as slogans. Uh, so some people still want to use this. It's coming back into common usage. Um, but others are sceptical of the notion for various reasons, and they might be right to be sceptical, of course. And even if they're wrong, they might be right in the sense that it might work for many things, but it doesn't work for cyberspace. And that's perfectly possible, that an old way of thinking doesn't fit a new way of dealing with the world. Again, the notions of the common good, well, they go back to Thomas Aquinas. You know, they go back a long way. They go back into Catholic social teaching, political philosophy in the 19th century, for example. You can find elements of this in Rousseau. It's all over the place. So is it applicable in the modern world? Is it applicable... In the digital age, is it applicable to cybersecurity? Will it fit the new shoe, in other words? Now, what do I take the common good to be about? Well, it's about justice. Not only in a legal sense, in a moral sense, an ethical sense, and so on. It's about access, of course. These are things that have been discussed this afternoon. I feel as though I'm just going to repeat everything that's already been said, but in a slightly <laughs> different order. But forgive me for that. It's about the allocation of resources. It's about the relic and the fairness and justice of those allocations. It's about the relationships between rights bearers, but also the relationships between rights bearers and duty bearers, and between duty bearers and other duty bearers. In other words, it's about the relationship between rights and duties. And it's also, this is always, always a paradoxical bit, it's about itself. Someone earlier, I forget who it was, was talking about the need for democratic forums, democratic interventions, be able to determine these things for ourselves collectively and so on. Deliberation on the common good is part of what the common good is, in other words. It's an activity, and we have to bear that in mind always. It's not something that comes ready-made. Okay, let's say something about the public and the private. This is my starting point just now. Now, it's possible to take the view that the distinction between the public and the private has now irretrievably broken down in the face of digital technology. This is expressed just a moment ago. The idea, it's gone. You can't get it back. And that may be right. On the other hand, we need to know what it is that we've lost. And we, <laughs> that, that, that's not so straightforward, necess necessarily. So, even if people who say this are right, are they right for the right reasons? The problem with the digital causation theory, if I can give it that title is that it presumes that prior to digitalization, there was a secure and robust conception of the public and the private in which the two, sp in which the two spheres were neatly separable and in a good polity separated in law and common practice. But was this, could this, ever have been so? I say that it's a false picture and that the basic premises of much thinking on the issue, whether digital or not, are therefore fallacious. And if that's so, it means that much of the discussion surrounding the issue is pointless, presupposing, as it does, two errors. The first, that of assuming that there's a clear and robust natural distinction between public and private. And the second, that the reason for the breakdown was digital technology itself, or digital technology alone. I'm not saying it's not a contributory factor. I'm saying it may not be the only factor here. The fact is that there was nothing to break down, in a sense, in the sense commonly assumed. What changed was the speed and penetration of the media, whereby the consequences of actions are disseminated. Now, I'm going to draw here, to some extent, on the work of Raymond Goyce, who I find quite useful here in a book, uh, Public Goods, Private Goods, that came out about 15 years ago now. He argues that the distinction which we often take to be a single boundary line of demarcation is not... We cannot, he says, begin with an ontologically realist account of the public-private distinction as a single unitary distinction, because the distinction is neither unitary nor necessarily coherent. He says, the public-private distinction is an ideological concretion. 
Someone said just now, you know, this is where the politics comes in. This is where the ideology comes in. You know, our conception of the private is a political and ideological construct, is the point here. In other words, we can't draw on it in the way in which natural rights theorists, like those who wrote the American Constitution, said, oh, natural rights, there they are, we'll make everything work around them. Goyce's point is it's the, the other way around. So, to continue... The idea of a clear distinction between public and private, and I have scare quoted those, is well entrenched in general political discussions. And this is a problem because there's no single clear distinction between public and private, but rather, Goyce says, a series of overlapping contrasts. And therefore the distinction between the public and the private should not be taken to have the significance often attributed to it. In other words, what he is saying, and I'm quoting him because I agree with him, is that appeal to the public-private distinction will, in itself, uh, will not in itself provide an automatic justification for any particular action or inaction. And we should always ask ourselves, therefore, why exactly do we want to distinguish public and private in this particular case? What are the purposes and values? that we need to, that we are appealing to, that we want to promote, or the opposite. In other words, we can't appeal unreflectively to this distinction in justifying a course of action. What we don't do, says Goyce, and he's right, I think, we don't first get clear about the distinction and then ask what we do with it. Generations of people brought up on John Stuart Mill's On Liberty have done that, and they're all wrong. For this, because... First of all, it, it doesn't hold water, but secondly, it's the wrong way around anyway. That's the point that's being made here. I'm not saying it's not worth reading John Stuart Mill in case people think I'm trying to do myself out of a job as <laughs> professor of political theory. I'm just making a point. What Goyce suggests is that we should first ask, what is this purported distinction for? And then we ask, why do we want to make it at all? So to quote him at a little greater length, he says, it's not that we discover what the distinction is between the public and the private, and then proceed to determine what value attitudes we should have to it, but rather that given our values and knowledge, we decide what sorts of things we think need regulating or caring for, and then stamp them public, or private, depending. The designations, public and private, should not be conceived as categories which provide antecedent justification, but rather as indicative of our agreements concerning where the boundaries are drawn in political, sorry, in particular contexts. So we need to disaggregate the whole distinction into many distinctions made for many different purposes. And we, need, we have to ask what exactly those purposes are. Ah. In other words, we need to reverse the polarity of our whole discussion. Now, this was true even without the digital problem being superimposed on it. It's even more true in the world of cyberspace, for the obvious reasons, some of which I'll now mention. So I've called this section not one but many, the variety of public and private. Now, it's the most obvious thing in the world that things that we used to think are private are now public in a certain way. I was sitting in front of a computer, and other people know what I'm doing. An MP got called, Simon Danchuk, the other day, who was banging on about Jeremy Corbyn being disrespectful because he didn't bow his head deep enough or something, or say the right national anthem or something. Um, he was caught tweeting at 11 o'clock on the 11th of November. <laughs> just think about that one. And then he said, oh, no, I did it earlier. It just took a while to go through. Well, <laughs> but the point is that, you know, you, got, you get caught out. Everyone got, gets caught out here. Justin Bieber, for example, he visited, like many of us, uh, the Anne Frank house in, um, where is it, in Amsterdam. And he wrote in the, the thing, you know, um, what did he say? Hopefully she would have been a believer. And, of course, the point about that awful comment is... You may just say, this is a stupid adolescent sort of comment. But the point is, he is not just any stupid adolescent. That immediately went around the world in digital form, and it revealed that he himself is the sort of person I'm going to talk about in a moment. The sort of person who creates the context in which they ask, in which they act, not the sort of person for whom the context is already given. And that's an important point here. 
And that's one of the things that the digitalization of the world has changed for all of us. You can think of many other examples, obviously. So, there's a variety of publics and privates, but we can distinguish among them, and this is just a, you know, an off the top of my head sort of shot, you know, private solo, you know, what I do by myself when no one else is around. Private family, that's not the same. Private friends, private social, social friends, social. Public agora, you know, the marketplace. Public consenting, public media, that's the digital world in a sense. Public political. But the point is that these all overlap. There's no clear boundaries between them. They mark differences, which are worth marking, but there's no absolute distinction between them. Some actions, we could argue, should only and ever be private solo. Others might be more or less appropriate at any of the different levels and degrees. But we should remind ourselves that it's not about the number of people, necessarily, who hear, see, witness, take part in an action. That's not the distinguishing factor that makes it a public or a private thing. Um, there are many things which we would not do in the presence of a single public other, but we would do if the single other were a friend, a wife, husband, friend, lover, or whatever. So it's not about numbers. It's about categories. It's about types. It's about contexts. There are many public performances which we would not repeat at home or at a dinner party. I'm not going to go home later on and give this talk again. because you know, I don't think I'd be thanked for it. <laughs> um, again, I could get married in a private ceremony, but that wouldn't make it a private action. Because you know, getting married is a public ceremony, whatever the number of people attending it is. So... One of my points here is a very simple one. We've got to be aware of the context in which we're operating. Something that might be tolerable or, if unpleasant, in one situation becomes an intolerable in another. One of the problems, of course, of the digital age, and we've discussed Twitter and Facebook and things earlier on, is that contexts are stripped out and leach into each other in sometimes alarming and you know, bewildering ways. In fact, that's not only, you know, I experienced this myself pre-digitalisation, never mind post-digitalisation. When a PhD student of mine had a picture on the front page of the Sun and the Telegraph, uh, naked except for a large teddy bear. And I won't tell you how that all happened. Um, it was for charity and it was something to do with that sort of movie, you know, where people take off their clothes for the Women's Institute. Um, but the point was, she said very vehemently at the time, oh, we never intended this to become national. It was only a local thing. But that was 20 years ago. But now that happens even quicker, unintentionally. The guy the other day who said, this is not what a rapist looks like, stupid comment. But 20 years ago, it would not have instantly gone around the world. Now it does. So the context had just stripped out, and what might have made some sort of sense, or even if it had made no sense, would have been kept quiet, now can't be kept quiet, and its sense is up for public grabs, as it were. So there's a problem about context. We can't simply assume that they are now what they used to be. Sometimes I think it's probably safest to assume that in the digital world there is only one context, and that context is one devoid of irony devoid of subtlety, in which the slightest passing utterance is given the same weight as the mightiest theoretical pronouncement. You know, two minutes on Twitter will tell you that. Um, so the context is shifting, our responses have to shift with them. Again, people often misunderstand the situation which they're in. They may have a false graft on, grasp on their position in the world. And the point I make here is a very simple one. Some of us are situation takers, some are situation makers. Some people, by being there, change the situation in which they're in. If the Queen came into this room, never mind whether we're Republicans or not, it would make a huge difference to everything instantly. And it would be an event in our lives in a way which would, it wouldn't be an event in hers. I'm sure she doesn't remember everyone who's met her, but they almost certainly remember when they met her. Oh, you know, that sort of thing. So, a politician being here, Justin Bieber being here, they make it into a public event. They can't then turn around and say, oh, it was private. 
they made it public by being who they are and being where they were in a certain situation. They create this situation. And this is something which, which we need to take account of. One way of taking account of this, and here's where I'm leading to our conclusion before Maria gets worried about time, is let's talk about very quickly doing things with words. Philosophy 101, J.L. Austin, how to do things with words. You're all familiar with what I'm now going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway, because it sort of fits. The location of an utterance determines its meaning, or affects its meaning, maybe. Meaning in an abstract sense, a purely abstract sense, is not enough. An utterance is always more than that. So illocution, the act constituted by an utterance, is its performative dimension. Saying, I do, in the marriage ceremony is the obvious case. Okay, I name this ship, you know, it's not a description, it's the deed. But take the question of a joke, you know. People often say now, oh, this was a, this was a slightly racist joke, admittedly, but made in the context of a private club or something, blah, blah, blah. You've heard it, you've heard all this stuff. But of course, whether something is a joke or not is not merely a matter of abstract meaning, to start off with. It requires a performative context, and this can be well or mis- or ill-judged. Of course, there's a hermeneutical circle here as well. An utterance might not be understood as a joke at all, you know, even a bad joke. It may just not be understood as a joke at all. And this comes back to the point about context. Why is it that we have to use that horrible little suffix, lol? which I personally can't bring myself to use, but a number of my interlocutors on Facebook use it. Well, because in a world devoid of obvious jokingness, reference, you know, irony and all the rest of it, you have to flag everything up because otherwise you're in danger of being taken the wrong way because the context doesn't do the work for you anymore. Or you have a bigger context in the way that I described it, which is stripped of all the nuance that the individual, more, let's say, micro-context would have had. So whether something is a joke or understood as a joke, contextualised as a joke, no, that's a problematical thing in itself. Ditto for irony, ditto for anything else you want to mention. And again, sometimes feel people fail to recognise that an utterance has the illocutionary force that it has, the performative force that it has. The obvious case, you know, has anyone ever had the experience of someone saying to them, we need to talk? <laughs> mm. Is any other phrase quite as ominous as that phrase? Again, the comment which I see now in digital forums just saying, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah. that is not a neutral comment. So we need to think about all those things and the things that we bring about by the use of our words, by our deeds. Okay. This really is my conclusion now. What I'm saying is that we need to consider very carefully in what we do, not only what we mean by the public and what we mean by the private, and therefore how we're going to determine how we should regulate these things, because we shouldn't for a moment treat the private as a single thing that can be regulated in a single way, no matter how carefully distributed among the legal apparatus of the state. No, it is many different things, and it needs to be addressed with reference to that, to that nuance, to that differentiation. That's the first point I want to make. Secondly, we all need to be increasingly aware of the context in which we're operating and our effect on the context in which we're operating, whether we are affecting it by being in it, and even if we're not affecting it by being in it, what the domain requires of us to be intelligible in that context. In other words, responsibility is being thrown back onto us in that sense too. As part of that, of course, I argued earlier that we can't presuppose an abstract notion of the private. We have to think, what is worth protecting? What freedoms are worth protecting? Why are they worth protecting? We cannot simply assume that because something's in the home, therefore it's private. Because not everything in the home should be regarded as private, for example, in this sense in which we say that it's nothing to do with the police. Obviously. That debate has been won a long time ago. But here is where we enter the ideological and the political. Now, 
All I need to do is to see how all this can be understood in a contemporary digital context, link it with the common good, discuss other senses of privacy I've neglected here, examine how the relationship between public and private is to be negotiated in the cyber world, and I'll get back to you later on all of that <laughs> once I've sorted it out. But I would genuinely welcome your help. So if anyone is interested in this, please, please get in touch. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, James, for complexifying things for us. Um, and um, apologies, I'm normally um, quite a strict chair, but in the latest year I've, re I've relaxed. <laughs> so I thought it was really interesting presentations and I um, w was, wasn't willing to stop people um, halfway through their sentence. So we haven't got a great deal of time, but we do have a, a bit of time for questions or comments people might want to make in response of, to any of the presentations. That 90% of data is um, newly um, seen about us this year. And I, I don't think that's a dated statistic. It's every year 90% more data is available. Uh, so when Cassia says that, that privacy is gone, she's echoing what Scott McNeely said 15 years ago, and there's 15 years of compound interest. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so to some extent, I think it means you shouldn't give up, that it's important to try and stem the flow of data next year because it's going to put all your previous collection as only 10%. Um, I'm interested in a project to try and do that with data collected by um, personal devices, Internet of Things devices. Um, I need some help. Um, it fits in beautifully with Sarah's um, suggestion of, of trying to set people's expectations by, by having a project um, <coughs> which is part of part of their network infrastructure, if you like. Um, I've, it's called the Internet of Thongs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I desperately need some publicist-type people and all sorts of others. But the idea is to try and filter, expose, and hopefully distort the data that's collected by um, Internet of Things devices. So if people are interested, what, what do they do? Yeah, we were out <laughs> Ask him later. Um, yes, there's a question. Um, I just have a question, and I actually, some of it was answered by, um, by you, the last speaker. But um, in this whole conversation about data, I keep wondering what exactly data means. Because in every single presentation, data has this omnipresent, omniscient, um, obscure, kind of like, I can see the, the graphic for it, it's this weird visualization of something. And I just wonder exactly how do we account for our own, who we are and our own individualism in this, in this, in this like really strange, I don't know if I'm at, like, making sense, but it just seems like in the conversation around data, data becomes this thing, this like being that doesn't account for us like participating in the choices that we make that cannot be defined by our Facebook likes or our hashtags. Because I think all of us also are very conscious of what we put on social media or what we put online. It's not we're just like passively, we all are participating both ways. So I just wanted to know like how you would explain exactly what data is and how you individually um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the question went away from me, but I guess like I'm trying to understand like why we make in conversations about data like we make it seem so nebulous. Like I think data like oh, I think data really always changes. Like the data is not like it's not black and white. Um, in there's a load of gray space. And data is already has always existed because data is just information gathered about a thing, and um, we humans have decided in a in and now uh, which data will be collect information could be collected in binary code and called data. So it's something that isn't just there, we decide what we're going to collect or not, in the same way that information overload is not new either. 
um, <coughs> from censuses uh, gone by where it's taken 10 years to just process the information and before they finished the next, the next census has started. Um, so none of this is, is, is new. What I think has become more complicated is that we can um, collect so much more information than ever before and process it far more quickly and store it um, so cheaply that it doesn't become a problem about space. So you can't, you kind of lose touch of what it really is because, <coughs> you know, it, does, it isn't even, you can't even see it anymore in terms of the size of the database that you're keeping or the server that you have, um, which is quite hard. Um, and I think that also when we talk about data and uh, the data that's collected at the moment, if anyone looks at databases, they're a total mess. So I think data at the moment is a bit of a myth that we need to kind of unpick actually what do we mean um, when we talk about it and insights from data. And that's really hard right now because all of that information that is being collected is generally pretty unusable. So also this idea of insights from data. We kind of talk about data as if it's perfect and easy and it's, and it's not. And it's also not new. <laughs> can I? Uh, another thing about why data can feel so kind of mysterious and confusing, I think, is because what network communications have done is that they've added into the mix uh, this whole business of metadata. So it's about the relationships between data, and they gener you know, we're generating mass layers of metadata, and we're actually not really built to pay that much attention to this even as a concept, let alone to really try and grapple with what's going on at this, at, on, on this other layer. And I think that's another reason why it feels, so yes, you may pay attention to the things that you put out there and think carefully about what they say about you to as many people and organisations as you might imagine would look at it. But I think you can't take account for how other people will use it and share it and respond to it and behave with it because it, that's just not really possible to do in the newly networked world, and it is still quite newly networked. Yeah, <coughs> just a, a quick comment. I think you're right. We shouldn't reify it. We shouldn't make it into a thing. Data is not one thing, but many. And, of course, the distinction between data and metadata is very important because it's, it's the latter, in a sense, that allows the corporate and governmental and other grips to have them in our power. And this does come back to a fundamental political question, then, about power and control and autonomy and you know, participation and all of those other sorts of things. So you know, that's why it becomes important. But as part of that, we have to disaggregate the notion of data itself. A lot of data is perfectly benign. Not all of it, maybe, but it's the uses of it which are the most possibly malign problems for us. And even when not actively maligned, certainly, let us say, persuasive or coercive or whichever other words you want to start inserting at that point. Can I just say something one thing about that as well? Uh, I think it's, I mean, some people have heard of Foucault, and he kind of brought out the notion of, you know, kind of... Uh, biopolitics or the body politics and the relationship. So we're used to kind of like, you know, traditional kind of, if you go out on the streets and demonstrate, you're with other people and you're kind of there immediately and connected and you're grounded. And, uh, but we've, we've kind of, uh, when what's happening now is kind of, the, and that would be called, he called the relationship of biopolitics kind of, uh, is kind of uh, panoptic. So, you know, you're kind of like, uh, or panopticon, uh, was it Jeremy Bant Bentham? Mm -hmm. And he invented the dis uh, design of a prison where uh, the prisoners can be, see, be seen from everywhere, from uh, just a few centralised uh, wardens. And in a way, what we've got now is like a net opticon, where everyone could be seen uh, by big data corporations and different organisations, so it's like uh, so, uh, but it's not like. And someone was using the word soft. Was it using the word soft? Yeah. This is what we're dealing with. We're doing. We're, de we're dealing with kind of a a soft relational netopticon age, <laughs> where everything could be traced and seen all at once, almost. And like the idea of like the cloud abstracts the notion of your relationship with data. You actually. You know, you, you try and touch a cloud, it disappears. And, and so all these words that are being used by companies make things be more abstract and intangible. And so the, uh, 
the relationship with, with data becomes much more distant. So, like everyone's suggesting, you don't put things on your uh, on your local drives or external drives now. They're saying putting it all on on the cloud, which you know, which was just a server somewhere else. That's all it is, and it's not a cloud. <laughs> and so this this kind of weird abstract non uh, language that's being used is making everyone. Uh, semantically confused already and so I completely understand where you're coming from and it also kind of makes you feel helpless um, because but yeah but it's yeah. not hopeless we can have fun with it <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, we're out of time but if there is one more question or comment maybe we can quickly right so I've set up a VPN that goes on top of the mobile phone, and it can check everything that goes in and out of the phone. So now I have full control of the data. And I actually, so I, I wanted to have that as a service for other people, because that really improves your privacy. You can collect your data. You can see what other companies are doing on your phone. So I talked to a lawyer, an IP lawyer, but he told me this is illegal. You can't, uh, you can't intercept the data. It's, you, you're breaking, well, you can't do that because you're breaking the uh, user agreement from, from the apps you have installed. So is there some kind of uh, some way that we can work around that, that is we don't get cr criminalized for getting our own data, like a fair use or a preemptive freedom of information act? Something like that. Is, is that a way? Is, is the issue that a third party would be doing that, so that you're doing it for me, or can I also not do it with my own data and my own apps? Uh, it works on the VPN, so if you can set up a VPN, yes, you, do, you can do it yourself. Otherwise, you would have to rely on a third party. And I thought, that third party, could we have something like a charity, run under a charity or not for profit? I mean, something that you're sure is not going to abuse or exploit that data. But it would not be criminal, it would be a breach of contract <coughs> of, a, of a, the licensing agreement. Right, in terms of the price. It's, it's a shame that our two um, legal scholars have left. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we can uh, post the question. Um, I can't answer it, but I think it's a, um, it's a question to raise. Anybody want to respond? Or is I've, I've, to I, respond? I could answer it, but I want someone else to talk because, you know, what do you reckon? <laughs> I, I don't know I, um, of specific tools that uh, I could refer to right now, that's the thing, if, if you're looking for a very particular answer. But the thing is that this is how the system works. Because you, normally you're not even allowed to, I don't know, open up your laptop or your uh, device or your phone anymore. You're not allowed to have access. It's all opaque. Mm. And this is how, how it works nowadays. It's, I, 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 it's somehow, propri proprietary networks, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, exactly. But is it not also the fact that you don't really own the apps that are collecting the data anyway? <laughs> so um, it goes back to this fact that you're just actually buying a license to use a thing that you don't own. Um, and then you go into these nutty issues of actually do you even own the information because you're, you don't have the technology to make it into the binary code necessary to make the data. So I can see that that, um, that is more like the is more the problem space, even in the user agreement, is that you just don't fundamentally don't own even the, th the thing that you have. Um, and one of my uh, biggest fears as a designer, particularly coming from industrial design, is that in the Internet of Things age, that we won't even own like the thermostats. You'll just be given them and potentially be given them for free as long as companies can have absolute access into your lives. <laughs> um, so that is absolutely not an answer for you. <laughs> I can see that that's not even just the terms of service, actually, that it goes beyond, actually, that most of the things on our phones we don't own. Mm. Can I just make one tiny point? I, it, this brings me back to a point that you made, which is about when we're thinking about questions of the commons and the public good, actually the right we need to defend is the right to be able to deliberate and to have control about processes of deliberation. And this is what we're seeing we have already lost, actually. And through these processes that everyone's just been discussing. Isn't the <coughs> indie platform the indie platform that we're trying to create this sort of peer-to-peer, non-cloud-based system? I thought that was something that was kind of addressing your 
That's the indie web as well. Yeah. The Errol, Errol Balkan, do you guys know Errol Balkan and it's the work that he's doing? Yeah. Yes. Is that not addressing some of this? Or is there a comment? Oh, I'm not like I'm. I'm not an indie web specialist, so and I don't know how much of this is being recorded. So, um, but there are many different ways that we can. You, like the internet that we have now is not the only network that we can have, and the way that and especially if you. Gosh, there's some really interesting things online that I could point you to. So, for instance, um, a, a kind of a, a gentleman called Vinay Gupta has recently written a piece on why why blockchains are relevant for, for, for us in a very, I think, quite an easy, in, in easy speak. Um, and he talks through that it's not just as, it, he really kind of explains the stack of the network that we're talking about and the issues of ownership and kind of public and private getting muddled within the whole stack of actually how, um, how technologies are made. Um, so it's not just as simple as saying like a peer-to-peer -peer network because the internet is kind of already decentralized but there's loads of centralized bits of layers um, for instance like DNS that make it centralized and really difficult so this idea of <coughs> re-decentralizing is kind of difficult because that's maybe not again it's another cloud thing it's maybe not that helpful um, it's actually about the kind of more permissions layers and thinking about other ways that we can make networks. And Indie is one project doing that. I have, I have got some answers out. Uh, I think there's various groups, but, but the thing is, the issue is, is what you're prepared to do to get to that point. Because pe uh, uh, in consumerism, what's the, there's another big C, which is comfort. But... Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, but the thing is, if you're prepared to sacrifice comfort for freedom, <laughs> uh, mm. uh, I think that's the issue that needs to be examined. Because, uh, say for instance, you can create your own local peer-to-peer -peer network with groups of people that are not connected to the internet, and you can go right back to BBS systems, mm. and uh, and uh, you can you can actually create your own. Groups uh, separate from the internet through networks, digital networks, which are all on GNU Linux. Yeah. So, you know, uh, yes, it can be done. And it can be done through, from, through mobile phones as well. But it's if other people want to do that with you. That's the thing. Because anyone can have, like, their thermostat paid for or their Sky television given to them free for a year and all this nonsense because people aren't prepared to make the effort to, to take control of their own conditions and and unfortunately until people get hurt themselves they don't and so there's only a few idiots like ourselves that are prepared to kind of think about this stuff and waste our lives asking these questions where the Sun newspaper goes what are they fucking talking about <laughs> and 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 then and then we sound as though we're intellectual when we're not we're just a human being trying to find a way around blocked systems but yeah. And so, so that's what we're dealing with, you know. So I, you're just yeah. bringing out one simple problem, that, uh, that, uh, which is one example that everyone's experiencing in different ways. And if people don't want to do it, it won't happen. I, I, I honestly, I couldn't disagree more. <laughs> well, I, I we're think, doing I it. Think, I think I that, no, because it's kind of like the IRC or Slack um, issue. So Slack is a... Is a is an application that allows you to have um, group conversations about a project if you're working in other places. Mm. And it's essentially what IRC allows you to do, uh, but it's not open source, it's not a, f a free Libra open source product. And there's a lot of, there's an awful lot of um, comments at the moment from developers who are saying, if you're on an open source project, you should be using IRC, not Slack. And yet designers like myself who are on open source projects are saying, well, Slack is the way that we find easiest to kind of communicate. And it deals with a lot of the issues of you as a human, and I think some of the problem with this is that technologies that um, perhaps are free and open source, that do concentrate some on of kind them. of ownership, don't have the kind of user interface or experience as humans we really need to use. So I think this is where di design has to be prioritised so that we don't 
not necessarily I think there is a value in creating um, to, like d developer experience tools and I think that's really important and that's why partly blockchain is so successful because it's an excellent developer experience but I think we have to prioritize user experiences in these and not create even more tools that no one's going to use I think we have to face reality that we need to make new normals we need to be building tools that our mums and dads will use um, and and that's the way forward and I think that mixed economy will come I don't think it's quite so dystopic okay can I just uh, that's the thing. <laughs> okay so we did a project with homeless people some mungos I worked with homeless people for 12 years and uh, so we decided to uh, do a project called zero dollar laptop project and that was where you kind of teach uh, homeless people uh, how to hack Windows and replace it with Linux and use open source technology on their own terms. And uh, we've got evidence that's been proven that homeless people are just as uh, hungry for change in their own culture with technology as anyone else could be and can be and they were and they are. And they're still using these laptops which are all recycled technology. You just need to let people know that it's there. And uh, I think the design issue is definitely true user uh, encouragement and kind of involvement is important but there's different levels in society where there's different issues that need to be explored on its own terms mm -hmm. and so and one size does not fit all so no, yeah. <laughs> I think we agree so <laughs> yeah. it's not either or brilliant thank you very much for coming on a rainy Saturday thank you very much for coming to the um, if you are interested do come along tomorrow for Sarah's workshop. And if you know young people who are engaged in those, who are thinking around issues of privacy, encourage them to come along in the afternoon for M and Arts workshop. And also do go to Featherfield to see the show by um, finishing next weekend. And do stay on for the evening performances. Thank you very much.